Good morning, and welcome to Elk Lake Baptist, whether you're joining us online or in person. It's so good to be together as we worship our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So this afternoon at 2 p.m., just out here in the foyer, there will be a baby shower for Narika Jacques at 2 p.m. So please come. You're all very welcome. Uh, on Saturday, March the 11th, there's a Young Life fundraising banquet. And if you'd like a spot at the table, please speak to Alan. Um, very excitingly, we've got the Jerapa family arriving in Victoria on March the 29th. Please pray for them as they make arrangements to come. Um, Dimitri, actually I'll start from the left. So Nelia and Solomia, who's eight, and Yeva, who's five, and David, who's three, and Dimitri, the dad, in the middle there. So, as we said, they're due to arrive on March the 29th, and Linda has been putting up a lovely notice board in the foyer, um, and she's in charge of collecting donations. So if there's anything you can donate, you can sign there, and her um, contact details are also in the bulletin. So these are items that will help them as they settle into Victoria. The call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 119, verses 9 to 16. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Our Abba Father, everything you do reveals your glory and majesty. Open our eyes to see what you are doing in our lives. Let us marvel at your good gifts and your wise provision. As we gather today in your name, we pray that you would fill our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Transform us, Lord, and make us more like you, through Jesus Christ. Amen. Our opening hymn for this morning is number 87, number 87, Fairest Lord Jesus. Would you please stand with me as we sing together?
Amen. Please be seated. Would you please bow with me as we pray? Oh, actually, pardon me. We're going to pray together. Uh, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer this morning. So if you know that prayer, feel free to pray along. Otherwise, just pray in your heart. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We remember that after teaching this prayer to his disciples, the Apostle Matthew records that Jesus spoke these words, saying, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Therefore, as you have now confessed to the Lord your sins and your forgiveness of others, may you rest assured in the promise that the Father has forgiven you. Amen. I'd like to invite the worship team to come forward. Oh, am I on? Ah, good. So at this time, the kids are... Uh, should head on to Adventure Time. And it's now our time uh, for the prayers of our community. So this is our opportunity to bring before our Lord and Savior um, our thanksgivings and our requests for his intercession. And any word of encouragement uh, that God may have given you during the week to share with your brothers or sisters in Christ. So feel free to raise your hand from where you're seated and share, and then I'll wrap it all together in a prayer at the end. All right, let's, let's pray. Would you please bow with me? Gracious God, we come to you this morning and we thank you that through the work of your son Jesus, you have cleansed us, cleansed us by his blood, not on account of our own works, but on account, on your, on account of your great mercy. For Lord, we recognize that there is no, um, it is not by our own efforts or works that we can come before you, but simply by your grace. And so, Father, we now appeal to that grace as we bring forward our requests and offer you thanksgivings. We pray that our prayers might be pleasing in your ears and that you would have mercy and act. For, Lord, we recognize that it is you who is the giver of all good things. And so we trust you with our lives, knowing that you have demonstrated your love and care for us through your son, Jesus Christ, who freely laid down his own life for us and who reigns at your right hand and is praying for us now as our great high priest. In his name, we entrust ourselves to you. Amen. Now I'd like to invite Carl to come and read scripture.
This morning's scripture reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. And this is dealing with false teachers. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus, Menaeus, and Philetus, who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes, and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they, are, they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, who has taken them captive to do his will. And this is the word of the Lord. Would you please bow with me as we pray? Gracious and gentle God, it is our prayer that you would give us peace. For we recognize that there are many things in this world that disturb our hearts and disturb our minds. And that in the state of being so disturbed over these things, we do not always respond in the way that your son Jesus would respond. But it is our desire that by the power of your Holy Spirit and through the wisdom of your word, you would open us to the power to respond in such a way that we might glorify the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and further the good news of his gospel. In his name we pray. Amen. For those of you who haven't been here the last couple of weeks, we've been working through the book of 2 Timothy. And one of the things that 2 Timothy is really addressing is the issue of shame and what happens when we get shamed. And it's hard enough to deal with shame that comes from when we do things wrong, when we sin or when we've made mistakes uh, and we suffer uh, people's looks and mocking and other things because of those things. But that's not really the kind of shame that Paul's focusing on here. He's focusing on what I might call misplaced shame. 
You know, the times when people mock us for things like praying, calling it a crutch or a waste of time, or when people um, criticize our acts of mercy in Jesus' name, or they call our generosity a waste, or they refer to our obedience to Jesus as disgusting or um, wrong, or they tell us to shut up when we encourage people to follow Jesus. This is misplaced shame. And the question that um, Paul's been bringing up again and again is, what do we do with misplaced shame? With the kind of shame that's brought against us because of our faithfulness to the gospel, to this good news about Jesus, which is not shameful at all, Paul has told us. Well, in those cases, I think, and I think Paul thinks this too, <laughs> I think we're tempted to do one of two things in response. I think we're either tempted to shrink back, that is, to stop doing what it is that those around us think is shameful, even though it's actually pleasing to God. And this is the temptation that Paul was combating in his first command of the book. In chapter 1, verse 6, you might remember he said, Fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. So spiritual gifts, like having the faith to pray for healing, or God's power to do acts of mercy in his name, or to give generously, or to speak words of prophecy, or to preach or teach, or many other gifts that are listed throughout the New Testament. These are things we are not to be ashamed of. This is part of God's advancement of the gospel. But the world, under the influence of the devil, will treat these acts of gospel faithfulness as if they were shameful, even though they're not. The shame that ought to be associated with doing what is wicked is misplaced, and applied to the righteousness that comes from God and the good news of Jesus Christ. And because of this misplaced shame, we may be tempted to shrink back and stop using the spiritual gifts that God has given us, the ways he's equipped us to help share and spread the gospel. Now, God's desire, however, is the opposite, Paul tells us. You might remember that instead of shrinking back, uh, we're called to fan into flame the gift of God, that we're to use them even more, he's saying. And yet this can lead us to a second temptation. And that temptation is to quarrel with those who are shaming us. And this is the temptation that Paul turns his attention to in this section of the second letter to Timothy. It is tempting, at least I find it tempting, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure some of you do too. It is tempting uh, to want to turn the tables on those who are trying to shame Jesus and his followers, us. That is, you know, this temptation to want to do something to prove that Jesus is honorable and those people trying to shame him, they're the ones that are shameful. For example, I think we are often tempted in this way when people try and play the science disproves Christianity card, right? You know, they pick some random scientific fact, which in my experience is often e isn't even a fact, um, and they try and use it to declare that a certain story or the claim in the Bible therefore is stupid. I don't know if you've encountered that kind of thing. I have. This is an act of shaming. It's trying to make you embarrassed to hold the faith claims that you have and to therefore change your mind. And we are tempted to respond to this, I think, in a certain way. I think, I'm going to put it kind of bluntly, but this is the approach that I think we often take, is that we want to go back and say, well, the Bible's not stupid. You are right? Like, I mean, we might not say it that way, as Christians will probably tell them that they're stupid in the most polite, kind, and loving way. You know, in fact, I think we sometimes talk about speaking the truth in love this way. It's the truth I want to tell you is that you're stupid. I'm just going to say it in the most loving way possible. <laughs> now, this isn't the best idea. <laughs> Paul is trying to point this out to Timothy, is that he recognized that this is a temptation for us, and he recognizes the temptation for Timothy, uh, and he, we know this because he names two guys. He names two men, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who are essentially declaring that part of the gospel that Paul has preached is stupid. That's what they're doing. And surprisingly, these, me, these men are not outside the church. They're part of the church. In fact, they're teachers within the church in Ephesus. But in verse 18, Paul writes that they have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. In other words, they have decided that the gospel Paul preached, the gospel that proclaims a future physical resurrection, that part of it at least, is stupid. And because they think the idea of a future physical resurrection is stupid, is shameful, we might say, they have chosen to change the gospel that Paul had been preaching to fit their own ideas. 
As we learned earlier in this series, this is one of the ways shame works. Shame is kind of like a mother of false teaching, right? You're embarrassed about this certain thing, so you are tempted to change the truth about it. And Hymenaeus and Philetus have done that very thing. They find the idea of a bodily resurrection in the future embarrassing that in that culture, the body wasn't seen as a good thing. You know, spiritual stuff was good. Material stuff was kind of like, ugh. And so it's kind of embarrassing to them. So they want to hide this embarrassment by changing the gospel. And Paul knows that this change of the gospel will be concern, a concern to Timothy because as he says at the end of the verse 18, he says, by doing this, they are destroying the faith of some. Now, I think you and I can relate to this a little bit. You hear people saying certain things about Jesus or the gospel and they try and heap shame on it. And you see people's faith in Jesus being destroyed because of this. It's hard not to want to just jump in and dispute with the troublemakers and put them in their place, right? And yet that is exactly what Paul is instructing Timothy not to do. Verse 14. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Verse 16. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Verse 23. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Uh, that word resentful is really to be able to take it but not dish it out back again. So Paul does not want Timothy to get up quarreling with these wayward teachers about the particular things they are teaching. These ones who are ashamed of the gospel he's preached. Why? It's a good question. Why not stand up for those whose faith is being destroyed by this corruption these, of these shamers? Well, Paul gives us, and Timothy, at least two good reasons why not to just head straight into quarrels with people intent on shaming the gospel. And the two reasons are these. First, in verse 19, right after acknowledging that they destroy the faith of some, Paul goes on to write these words. He says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, The Lord knows those who are his. Even though some people are being corrupted by this false teaching, those who belong to God, those who are his, his chosen ones cannot be stolen out of his hand, he's saying. The Lord knows those who are his. They're in his hands. And this quote is actually a quote from Numbers chapter 16, which tells the story of Korah's rebellion. So this is the story, if you're not familiar with, where Korah and a number of other Levites uh, confronted Moses and essentially claimed that God works through us just as much as he works through you. Uh, and, you know, we don't like this idea that, you know, Aaron is the only one who gets to be a priest. We want to be priests too. We want to do all those things ourselves as well. Uh, and this crisis was dealt with not through Moses or Aaron being clever with words or quarreling with Korah. It was dealt with by the Lord removing Korah and his followers from the face of the earth. Pretty dramatic. <laughs> and making it plain to everyone else that Moses was the one through whom his words of revelation had come. In other words, just as God acted to save Israel from the false Korah back then without the need of quarreling, so now God will save all the believers in Ephesus from the false teaching of Hymenaeus and Philetus without the need for Timothy to take it to them with quarreling. They will not be able to destroy the faith of those who belong to the Lord. For the Lord knows those who are his, and he will act to protect them. So first then, quarrels with those who are shaming God's gospel are not required in order to save their faith. So we can kind of like take it down a notch when, when we see what they're doing. God is powerful and faithful to save those who belong to him without having to quarrel um, with the people who are bringing these kind of acts of shame towards them. In other words, entering into quarrels with those who seek shame isn't helpful. And the, this is the first reason why not to quarrel. 
The second reason, essentially, reinforces that same point, but from a different angle. This time, Paul is showing Timothy how quarreling not only doesn't help, it in fact, in many cases, harms. Starting in verse 25, we read, Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them. Again, notice that it's God that does it. God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So it's important to recognize here that you and I aren't the players, right? It's the God and the devil. And God's goal is not to heap shame upon those who shame us or his son Jesus. God wants those trying to shame Jesus and his followers to be saved, to be rescued from the trap that they've been caught in. As Paul writes, that they, his desire is that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. In other words, turning the tables in a situation like this makes no sense, right? Why would you turn the sables and try and shame a person you want to save? Why would you try and shame someone just because they came shaming you and just flip it around? No, you're the one who's shameful if that's someone you're actually trying to save. You see, God doesn't want to only save believers who are under attack. God has plans to save the very people who are doing the attacking, who are bringing the shame upon us. Because God sees what we can't see. He sees the hearts of every human being. And he knows the truth that we don't always remember. That the gospel is good news. And it's good news for everybody, even people who say they hate it. And therefore, the only way a human being could ever speak against the gospel is if they have been deceived, if they don't really understand the truth. And if you want to help a person understand what they don't understand, shaming them is one of the worst things you and I could do. This is why Christians should not quarrel with those who shame us. We should not try and turn the tables on them. Turning, trying to turn the shame back onto the one shaming us is not helpful and it even times hurts. It makes it harder for that person come to, to come to God. And yet, sadly, I feel that that is what much of Christian apologetics has become today. We debate with opponents, and what is the thing we hope for when we debate with them? We hope for other people to be listening and to think that we sound smart and they sound dumb, that we will be held in honor and that they will be publicly shamed and we think we're doing a service to Jesus Christ. But Jesus wants to offer salvation to his opponents just as much as he wants to protect those who already believe in him. And so if this is what we're not supposed to do, the question arises, what are we supposed to do when misplaced shame lands on us for our faithfulness to the gospel? How do we respond to misplaced shame in a helpful way? Well, Paul identifies at least three ways to respond that are actually helpful when we're being shamed for our faithfulness to Jesus. Three ways of responding helpfully. First, we are to present ourselves to God. Second, we are to cleanse ourselves from what I'm going to call dirty tactics. And third, we are to gently teach the words of God. So present yourself to God, cleanse yourself from all dirty tactics, and gently teach the words God has actually spoken, not our own ways of trying to defend him. So in verse 15, we hear the first one. In verse 15, Paul writes, Do your, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, literally an unashamed worker, who correctly handles the word of truth. Thus becoming an un unashamed worker, someone who's not feeling the effects of the shame that other people throw at you, happens first of all by presenting yourself to God as one approved. In other words, what other people think of us matters, right? I mean, this is why shaming hurts and can really throw us for a loop. When you get mocked and those things, it's gonna cut to the heart. 
But the first and most helpful thing we can do when we experience things like that is to present ourselves back to God and ask for his judgment of us. And this is very important because of two reasons. One, sometimes the shame that we experience is actually well-placed shame. That people have complained about something because we actually have wronged them. And sometimes we come before the Lord in prayer and he convicts us when we ask him, what do you say about me, Lord? And his answer is that we've actually done something that's shameful. We have sinned against someone else and we need to seek forgiveness and reconciliation with that person. But at other times, and it is this case with Timothy, when we present ourselves before the Lord in prayer and ask, what do you say about me, Lord? We will hear the Lord making it clear that while other people may disapprove, he approves and that he gives us his assurance that we need not be ashamed. In other words, it's what God thinks of us that matters. And to receive the assurance of what he thinks for us, we need to present ourselves before him in prayer and ask him in prayer for his approval. Am I doing what is approved in your sight? So when we present him ourselves this way, this is one of the most powerful ways to help have shame lifted off of our back. To be able to walk into a situation where people may mock us but know confidently that what I am saying and what I'm doing is not shameful. It is approved by God. So the first helpful way to respond to being shamed is simply to pray and to present ourselves to God and let him declare his approval or his correction if we do need to go and offer that for our wrongs. So if he says what we have done is pleasing in its sight, it lifts the weight of misplaced shame from off of our shoulders and enables us to respond in helpful ways to those who are shaming us. So the first step that's helpful is to present yourself to God in prayer. The second helpful thing is to cleanse yourself from all dirty tactics, namely the tactics that the other guys are using <laughs> in this case. This is the point of the illustration that Paul gives in verses 20 and 21. And it's a little bit tricky because the NIV, you know, trying to use more modern language, uses the word articles, articles of gold and wood, that kind of thing, instead of the more old-fashioned word vessels, uh, which gives you the picture of something that contains something, which is important to the illustration. And also because it gets rid of the honor-shame language. So more literally, verse 20 reads, in a large house there are vessels, things that can hold stuff, not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for honorable purposes, and some for dishonorable or shameful purposes. To make the picture more vivid, we might say that in a large household, there is a golden cup from which the master drinks, and there is a clay chamber pot in which he relieves himself. One is for an honorable purpose, drinking. One is for a dishonorable, lowly, or shameful purpose, that is, removing human waste from the house. Paul's point is that if you want to be a vessel that gets used by God for noble purposes, then as John Stock puts it, the master of the house lays down only one condition. The vessel he uses to drink from must be clean. Right? Who wants to drink from a chamber pot? No one. The contrast here then is between false teachers and good teachers. Teachers like Hymenaeus and Philetus on the one side and Timothy on the other. Just as Paul has previously identified Timothy as the one who correctly handles the word of truth and the other two as having swerved from the truth, Paul is now picturing Timothy and Hymenaeus as two contrasting vessels. Referring to a teacher actually as a vessel is not uncommon in the New Testament. In fact, in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, God calls Paul after he as, as he converts to a Christian, he calls Paul his chosen vessel to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. It's a beautiful image. It's the picture of uh, God being the one who brings the gospel, but using Paul as kind of a cup to carry the gospel in and give it to others, if that makes sense. That's the image. And thus Paul is saying that Hymenaeus and Philetus have become dirty cups, dirty vessels because they've swerved from the truth. They are no longer filled with the refreshing and clean water of the gospel. They are now full of poop, we might say, and cannot be useful to God again until they have been cleansed. And Paul is warning Timothy to not go down that same road, 
to avoid doing the same kinds of things that led these false teachers to dirty their vessels and therefore become useless to God. So then, what did these false teachers do to dirty themselves? What were they doing that got them into this kind of trouble? Well, multiple times, Paul warns Timothy against two things, about quarreling about words and about godless chatter. This is verses 14 and 16, also then again in 23 and into 24. Now, um, it seems to safe to say then, because he's talking of these two things so often, the assumption is that these are the things that Hymenaeus uh, was doing and that he doesn't want Timothy to do. Um, so he doesn't want Timothy to get involved in these kind of quarreling about words or in what he calls godless chatter. In today's language, I think we might be able to put this a little more clearly um, with using the words that he wants Timothy to avoid the practices of spin and speculation. So quarreling about words is spin. In this case, it is about spinning the word resurrection so that it no longer applies to a future bodily resurrection, but only to a past spiritual experience, what we might call new birth, which is true. It's a real aspect of how the New Testament uses the word resurrection, but it doesn't only mean that. And these false uh, teachers have masterfully spun that word to try and convince people about something that is just not true. So that's uh, quarreling about words is spin, I would say, is a good way to summarize it today. And the phrase godless chatter, I would say, is a good way to summarize it, is with the word speculation. Specifically, this chatter is godless because it does not come from God. It's the idea of that person themselves. They didn't receive it by revelation. They just saw stuff in the text that wasn't answered, and they invented their own answer. So what these teachers are doing and teaching is not a word received from God. It's their own speculation. And Paul is saying that if Timothy wants to be a clean cup, useful to God for bringing the refreshing news of the gospel to other people, he must stay clean or cleanse himself by not using spin and by not teaching or preaching what is only speculation. This, I think, is the biggest challenge for you and me today. I think it's hard for us to keep ourselves clean or pure in this way. And the reason for that is because we live in a culture that is saturated with spin and speculation. We're born and raised in it. We breathe it. Whether it's the news or a movie, virtually everything you see on a screen has made it to your eyes because it's a clever spin or it's some controversial speculation. And Paul's warning is about the danger of bringing those practices which we're so familiar with in our culture into our reading and transmission of the gospel, into what we find written in the Bible. I think we're often blind to the fact of how dangerous speculation can be when it comes to reading scripture. Because the Bible has a, quite a lot of gaps. And by gaps, I mean it raises a number of questions to which it does not give an answer. And we want to answer them. <laughs> don't we? Uh, an obvious example of this is the lone reference in 1 Corinthians verse 29 to those who are baptized for the dead. Has anyone ever read that phrase? Those who are baptized, it is mentioned nowhere else in Scripture, and Paul tells us nothing about what it might mean. But that does not stop us from speculating about it, what it might mean. And we see this. As one commentator has uh, written, he's counted at least 40 different speculative answers in other commentaries he's read as to what those words might mean. And the problem here, as with all speculation, is that we end up getting very attached to our own ideas when you speculate. Because they're not God's ideas. They're my ideas. And I'm attached to me. <laughs> I don't know if you're attached to you. But we get attached to our own ideas about how to answer these speculative things. And when we encounter someone else who has a different opinion of how it goes, what do we do with them? We quarrel. And when we start quarreling, what do we do to try and win? We spin. We start taking words in other places of scripture and using them in, in ways that they weren't originally intended to be used to spin meanings to support our cause. We speculate and then spin. And this, I believe, 
is what Paul is saying is how Hymenaeus and Philetus ended up the heretics that they were. They indulged in speculation that led to spinning, that led to swerving from the truth. And Paul is pleading with Timmy to avoid these practices of speculation by spin and by so doing keep himself clean and therefore useful to God. In other words, we might say Timothy is to show restraint. He is to keep to the main points of the gospel, the good deposit that Paul has given to him, and avoid going beyond it into things that we would call today speculation. And when others want to spin words in the gospel, he is simply to ignore engaging with that and simply come back to the clearly revealed main points of the gospel again and again and again. This overcomes shame because it makes us useful to God. Avoiding speculation and spin allows God to use us like a clean vessel and to bring the ref uh, refreshing water of what he has actually revealed to thirsty people. And it is God who, through the gospel, then brings repentance. And he's the one that convinces people's hearts, even the hearts of those who previously spoke against the gospel. It is not by our cleverness, what God has chosen to reveal that he leads people to repentance. So this then is the second helpful way to respond to misplaced shame is that we cleanse ourselves from the dirty tactics of speculation and spin that are used against us and thereby make ourselves useful vessels in the hand of God. And finally and briefly we do this gently. As Paul writes in verse 24, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed. The choice not to use dirty tactics is also the choice to patiently endure those tactics when they're used against us and to respond instead with gentleness and kindness. The devil has deceived people into thinking that the good news about Jesus is not good. But by first presenting ourselves to God for his approval, we can become unashamed workers, people who know that their service to God and his gospel is not shameful. And then second, by refusing to use the dirty tactics of spin and speculation, we can avoid the foolish quarreling that only ruins those who listen. And then finally, we can do this with gentleness by the power of God, who will use us as vessels to bring his refreshing water of the gospel to others even to the very ones who are trying to shame us. So my brothers and sisters, when we, are ashamed, when we are shamed by others for being faithful to the gospel, for using the spiritual gifts that God has given us to further the good news about Jesus, let us not shy away or quarrel. Instead, let us present ourselves to God, cleanse ourselves from any dirty tactics, and be gentle with those who oppose us. Or as Paul puts it, flee the evil desires of youth, not necessarily sexual things. I think here it's the attitude that we already know it all and know how to do it. Plead the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. For it's in this way, from a pure heart, that God overcomes all the shame that the world can throw against us. And in this way, we become vessels that are useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. Amen? Amen. Would you please bow with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words from Paul because we recognize that we do have to endure shame. And particularly, Lord, we endure misplaced shame people who do not understand how good the good news is and therefore ridicule us, mock us, and despise us when we remain faithful to you and your son, Jesus. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd help us not to shrink away and that you'd help us not to dive into quarrels in response, but that instead we would come to you in prayer and that we would hear your approval of us and that would lift the weight of shame off of our backs and that then we would avoid using dirty tactics to try and win arguments about speculations and spin, but that we would instead just restrain ourselves and stick to the things that we know you've clearly revealed in Scripture and when we respond. And that when we respond with these things that you have revealed, we would respond with gentleness. 
For we know that it is by your power and it is your will to save not only those who are under attack, but to even rescue those who are doing the attacking. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd help us with this by the power of your Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're going to close by singing hymn number 11. This is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. This is hymn number 11. Would you stand with me? So in this world, Jesus promises us, you will have trouble. And part of that trouble is going to be the fact that people are not going to understand the gospel and they're going to treat you shamefully when you exercise your spiritual gifts. But you don't have to respond in kind. You can present yourself to the Lord, you can avoid their tactics, and you can gently proclaim their gospel. The gospel which, as, Tim, as Paul writes to Timothy in chapter 1, verse 8, or starting in verse 9, is this, that he, that is Jesus, has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. And this grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now may you go in the knowledge that you are held in the hand of your God and Savior and that he will hold you fast. May you go in peace and serve your Lord. Amen.